Good afternoon, this is Marshall Davis, and this is another talk about Christian non-duality. Today I'm going to be talking about seeing what you really are. This episode is going to be very practical today. I'm going to be pointing directly to what you are. There are three steps that I'm going to take you through. In reality, there's only one step, it's just seeing. And the first two preliminary steps before that uh, are just preparation. Uh, it's kind of like a, a long jumper who's uh, uh, running up to the approach. Only the final takeoff counts. First, let's take a, a long, good look at who you are physically. Now, we can do that in a mirror. And the bigger the mirror, the, the better in this case. Or if you're watching this in front of a computer or on an iPhone, you can use the video or the, or the camera app. I am recording this outside today uh, on my laptop and I can see a little square down in the bottom right corner uh, while I'm recording this. But anyway, you can see yourself just find a way to see yourself and uh, we're going to take a long objective look at ourselves. So look at yourself and what is it that you see? For this part, don't worry about what you feel about what you see. That really doesn't matter. We had to put our emotions aside as much as possible now. Uh, even though emotions are definitely a part of the body that we are seeing here. Uh, but we will deal with those emotions in the next part. For now, let's just look at what we see in the mirror or on the app as if we were looking at someone else. Pretend that the image that you are seeing is not you. So what do you see? As I look in this little picture here, I see an overweight balding guy with a, a beard and wrinkles who is clearly of retirement age. I see an example of Homo sapiens, part of the ape family, and you are too, you can see that. So uh, we are part of the ape family just as much as any silverback or orangutan is at the zoo or in the wild. Now this particular one that I'm looking at has less hair and we all have a larger cerebral cortex than the others in the ape family but other than that we are almost identical with our jungle cousins. So we're animals like any other animal on the planet. And this ape that we're seeing in the mirror has a name and has a personality just like domestic animals do. I mean, if you've ever owned a pet, you know that each one is unique with its own name and personality characteristics. And we're the same way. We just happen to be more self-conscious and happen to be able to communicate better and be able to use tools more effectively than other animals. So it turns out that Darwin was right. We are not fundamentally different than other animals. We all have the same animal ancestors, which got Darwin into trouble with Christians back when he, he first proposed that. The fact that we are animals means that we are physical beings with a built-in expiration date. We are mortal. We will die. Now this is important to see and to see clearly. That is why all of the great spiritual traditions make it a practice for initiates to meditate on their own death in order to see who they really are. Not just think about death in general or in the abstract or, or try to deal emotionally with other people's deaths, but to really come face to face with our own death. It's just a matter of time until we die. Less time for some of us than others because of our age. 
to see this aspect of ourselves clearly, it helps to have some first-hand experience of, of death. Now, as a minister, I've had that, but a lot of people don't get that experience too much these days, not like they used to anyway. I mean, we don't even prepare dead bodies in our homes, as was the practice not too long ago when I was a young minister. There was a funeral where the funeral director was asked by the family to prepare the, the body for burial in the person's home. And the wake and the funeral were also in the person's home. Because that's the way it always used to be. But that's not the way it is anymore. In fact, we don't hardly see people in caskets much anymore because of the increasing popularity of cremation and memorial services or celebrations of life as they're called now, rather than the, the way it used to be with a wake, you know, a visitation at the funeral home, a viewing, and then a funeral. It's eye-opening to see death. It's one way of seeing what we really are. And it is the beginning of wisdom. It is no accident that in the most famous of the Upanishads, the Katha Upanishad, the teacher of the, of the young man seeking to discover who he is, that teacher is death. Death teaches us what we really are, or at least what we are not, that we are not our bodies. So let's look again at what we are. The second step is to look beyond the physical bodies to the psychological reality that we are all familiar with. To do this, we don't need a mirror or a camera or an app. All we have to do is close our eyes. And I think that's the best way to do it, to close our eyes. Point here is to experience with our minds all the thoughts and the emotions that we have. And I find that easiest to do when we have our eyes closed. All we have to do is close our eyes and just let our minds loose to do what our, what our minds do. And what our minds do is think and feel. And when we do that, we are very aware there's a lot going on in our heads. In fact, it's hard to stop what's going on in our heads, which anyone who has tried to meditate knows. And not all of what's going on in our heads is good. There is a lot of suffering there. Our thoughts sometimes go in bad directions. And because of our more complex brains than other animals have, we have more complex personalities and we are vulnerable, therefore, to neuroses and emotional problems and depression and anxiety and all types of mental illness. But we also have access to being able to create art and music and to reason and create religion and love and joy. I mean, we humans have a rich interior life. And we call all this taken together as our personalities. And this is what many spiritual traditions identify with our soul or our spirit or our self. More recently, people have started calling this the ego. It doesn't matter what we call it as long as we see it. And we see that we identify ourselves as it. In fact, we tend to identify ourselves with this interior life more than we do with our exterior body. We tend to think, or at least we hope, that this interior part of us may outlast the body. That wish gave rise to the whole idea of spirits and ghosts and immortal souls and heaven and hell and reincarnation and all types of afterlife. But just look at it objectively. We know that these thoughts and feelings originate 
with the brain and the body. And therefore, they are no more permanent than the body. And they're actually less permanent because they're only real in a secondary sense because they are mental constructions created by the brain, which is part of the body. This interior life that we have is affected very much by what happens to the body, whether it's healthy or not, and is affected, affected dramatically by things like strokes and traumatic brain injuries. When we think about this, it is clear that when the body dies, this aspect, this personality aspect dies. And the personality be can begin to decay long before the body, which is what you have seen if you have had any experience with anyone with Alzheimer's disease. Our psychological selves are fragile. They are temporary and they are completely dependent upon the health of our brains and our bodies. As much as we would like to think or hope otherwise, when we think about it, we realize that our psychological selves are not real in any permanent self, permanent sense. And that way, they are not what we really are. So we'll go on to step three. Look again. Now, this is the important step. This is the long jump that I was talking about at the beginning. This time, we don't need to look at a mirror at our bodies. Or we don't have to close our eyes to examine what's going on with our thoughts and our feelings. This time, we can keep our eyes open. But as we keep our eyes open, instead of looking outward, just try to look inward. Now, this is tricky, but just try it. Notice what is looking out. Notice your own awareness. Just be attentive to what it is that is aware. And as you do this, do this naturally and gently. Don't force it. Don't use intense concentration or anything like that. Just be conscious of being conscious. And not being conscious of anything in particular. Just pure consciousness. Now when we do that, these thoughts will come in very quickly to fill in the space, fill in the inner quiet space. And that's all right. When they do, just let them be. Don't try to force them out. Just let them come and let them go. But as that happens, notice the silence and the spaciousness that is between the thoughts and behind the thoughts and the feelings, that from which everything else arises. And when you do that, you you notice that it's kind of like the silence between movements in a symphony or, or maybe the rests in a musical score or even better, uh, like the, the space, if you can hear it and notice it, between the notes themselves. Or to use a visual image, it's like the, the space between the, the stars on a, a clear night. Be aware of that which is present when nothing else is. And even if you catch only a second of this, of this silence and this space, that's enough to start with. Now I'll tell you what I see and maybe that will help you to see. When I look, I see nothing. I see literally no thing. I see clear spaciousness that has no end. You can call this subjectivity if you want, or we can call it 
consciousness, if you want. But it's probably best not to call it anything, because as soon as we name it, then we've made it into an object or an experience or something. And it's not that. It's more basic than that. It is the nameless subject that is aware of everything else. As I see this, it is brilliant, it is shining, it is limitless, and it is eternal, it is knowing, it is omnipresent, it is accepting of everything, it is embracing of everything, it is peaceful, and it is joyful. The Apostle Paul, who, who knew this, described it with these words, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. These are qualities that the Christian spiritual tradition, as well as others, associate with godliness. And this is how Christianity describes Christ and the Holy Spirit. This is seen inside us. And when we see this inside, we see it is also outside. The whole world becomes the kingdom of God because the outside is inside. As Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we see this outside as well as inside and that they are the same, then we notice that everything here, including our physical bodies, appears in this. And our personalities that we were just talking about appears in this. Everything is in this because this is all there is. That's what we are. We cannot be other because there is no other. This is our true nature that cannot die because it was not born when our bodies were born. This is what we are. This is what you really are. Or as the Upanishads famously put it, Thou art that. And that is it for today. Grace and peace to you.